Welcome back. We've finished up our Gross discussion looking at an overview of generally recognized as safe, how that works, and how that petition process for self-affirmation works. So we're shifting away from that component of the food additives amendment, and we're beginning with the food additive petition, the cousin to Gross, um, potentially even the parent, and looking at an overview of that process this week and then next week getting into the specifics of what that looks like. As I've mentioned before, it's needed just to jump right into the food additives amendment, but that's not the process that we should be going through. Uh, we have to ask, why are we here looking at a food additive petition? Why aren't we looking at something else? Uh, there could be a lot of different options we're looking at. So why are we here? And the simplest answer is Gross has failed. And we saw in the last lecture, what happens, we have a food or component of food it would be considered added under the adulteration amendments. And we also have this definition of food additive in food, the food additive amendment. And so if our particular substance qualifies both as added and as a food additive under the amendment, we're here and we're trying to figure out what does that amendment mean for us? Because if we don't comply with the amendment, then we're back into this adulteration risk, either as an added substance or as an unapproved food additive. So ultimately, the goal is to avoid a designation as adulteration, and so that requires complying with the food additive amendment, and which means we're not having an intended use to impart color. We saw in the Gross lectures how the FDA could put some qualifications on the Gross notifications it handles about intended uses to impart color. Color additives go through their own process. And what we'll see, and even in the readings we see this, that the color additive petition, the food additive petition, nearly one in the same, some different considerations that we're looking at, different process overall, but the petition that you put together is pretty identical food additive petition, color additive petition, and for two years, considering that the food additive amendment passed in 1958, color additive amendment didn't pass until 1960, they were one in the same for two years and then separated out in 1960. So we'll see that there are some similarities, but here we want to keep it separate so our intended use is not to impart color. And naturally, we're not gross. If we're gross, we're in the previous two lectures and we're looking at that self-affirmation or we're looking at that voluntary notification. And it could be that we did the voluntary notification and the FDA brought us back here. In either case, we're not gross. So overall, what are we talking about when we say food added petition? So we're drafting a petition similar to gross with a focus on safety, very similar as we saw last, week, uh, last lecture about how those are very similar. It begins with an adequacy review. We saw this with Gross. The, the FDA receives it. The first thing they're going to do is say, is the petition complete? Are there elements that we're missing in the petition? And we'll get into what those elements are. And if so, we need to get those before the FDA will begin its um, review. The FDA, once it determines that it is complete, will publish a, a what they call a filing notice. That's public, so the, uh, you'll see it as a federal register in FR. Uh, and that goes out so industry can see that that's happening. And then the substantive review begins. And we're beyond just looking at, is this a complete application? We're looking at, is this an appropriate food additive? Is it safe? And so that's looking at chemistry, toxicology, excuse me, toxicology, environmental, and consumer safety. It's probably bringing in the EPA, depending on what the uh, additive is, because we'll talk about there's some components about uh, NEPA, National Environmental Policy Act, that comes in. If it's having applications to meat products, uh, FSIS, FISIS with the USDA will be involved. So it could bring other people, uh, other departments and heads of departments from outside of the FDA and outside of the um, Center for Food Safety and Applied Nutrition as well, maybe bringing in the Center for Veterinary Medicine or some other product uh, center. So that, but at the core, we're going to have those four con conducting the substantive review once that's done, they're going to compile an administrative record, they're going to have a recommendation, and they're going to issue a final regulation. And that final regulation is the same as, you know, when we saw FISMA rules coming out, and those were promulgated, and there was notice and comment periods. They, those are the same. We're having a new regulation issued. And so when we have a new regulation issued, we have uncertainty. We don't know if the, how the public reaction will be to that, regu to that regulation, to that approval of the food additive. And so we have, um, once it's published, we have notice, comment, potentially hearings, uh, potentially objections, and potentially judicial challenge. And that's why I included in the readings today a small expert, uh, excerpt 
on aspartame, one of the most controversial food additives and, and really an unusual example of what can happen with the food additive process, but it, it's very interesting to look at. So one of the things that we've talked about in looking at GROSS is do we do GROSS through self-affirmation or do we do GROSS as, not as a voluntary notification? And some of the considerations that we talked about, uh, do we want FDA determination? Does that add security? Does it add some certainty into what we're doing? We know that we're not going to be pulled off the market later. And here now we're comparing, well, why do people want to avoid the food additive petition process? You know, why are people, why are facilities so eager to cling to GROSS and to potentially avoid the food added petition. And here's why. Uh, we see the uncertainty. It's very public, uh, open to comment, open to hearing. We don't have that in the GROSS environment, so it's, it's unique to hear. And it's lengthy. We'll talk about statutory timeframes, but realistic timeframes. Uh, FDA, we saw in the readings, says 24 months longer for uh, others. The aspartame was eight years, a very long time. And so here we have potentially some parity with maybe drugs, not quite to most medical devices that the FDA regulates. Probably more novel medical devices would be similar to a two year plus range. Uh, so we have to maybe again ask, is this appropriate? Should this be applied on a wider basis? Does it make sense to have a 24 month process for food additives? And that uh, I think depends, it's very fact sensitive. So this is what we've been talking about, time and uncertainty. It's why GROSS is unpopular, or excuse me, why GROSS is so popular and the food additive petition <clears throat> unpopular. GROSS is quick. You can self-affirm. You can get a, typically a 30 to 90 day turnaround with a notification process. No one can comment. No one can object. Uh, no one can challenge it. There may be the ability to revoke the GROSS later and get it as an interim food additive or some other aspect. Uh, when we have some controversy around a particular gross approval. But for the most part, you're going to be able to enter the market without uh, a debate, which is can be valuable. So what's very unique about food additive petitions versus some of the other areas that we'll work with is it's statutory based. And a lot of places we look, it's code of federal regulations. It's an administrative rule. It's an interpretation of another statutory provision or filling in a statutory gap. But here, Congress specifically created an amendment with a specific process in mind. And so we have statutory criteria. And all of the petitioner elements are going to be found in 348B. And you may refer to the food additive amendment as Section 409, which was its original codification. Now it's currently codified as Section 348. Either one works. Uh, you'll hear in industry a lot of Section 409. And when you cite, though, you do need to cite to the current codification, 348B, or whatever section of 348 you're, you're looking at. So very similar to GROSS, we're looking at identity, intended use, technical effects, again, limited to non-color imparting technical effects, and method for determining quantity, because it's going to be very sensitive to levels of what levels are safe, what levels are suggested for dietary intake, uh, aggregate human exposure, how we, how does this build up in the system, does it build up in the human body, all of those sort of things are coming into play when we're identifying a particular substance. And I, I'm paraphrasing a lot of the, the statute. I do encourage you to look at B2. It's A through E are the statutory elements that are in there. The FDA has to have a method for determining the quantity that's going to be present of the substance, uh, lots of safety data that's going to be the core of any food additive petition. We'll get into that in the next lecture as we get into the approval criteria. But safety data is going to be the bedrock of what will determine the likelihood of success for a petition. And some unique elements that we're looking at, uh, manufacturing methods we saw in the voluntary notifications for GROSS was important. Here again, they're going to be important. Something that's unique to food additive petitions is an environmental assessment. I mentioned that a slide ago. The National Environmental Policy Act, I think that was 93 or 95, that was uh, promulgated and passed by Congress. And now the FDA is under an obligation to conduct an environmental assessment for the use and disposal of these substances. And so we have to make sure that there isn't going to be an environmental impact that will result from 
this use of this food additive. So that wasn't a requirement for a large history of the food additive petitioning process. You know, figure this came out in 1958, and we have food additive petitions through the 60s, 70s, 80s, early 90s. We get this NEPA requirement, and so from 93, 95 going forward, this is a new element that must be passed. And if it doesn't pass the NEPA environmental assessment, it uh, may not be approved, or there may be stronger conditions on how it can be approved or the levels that are safe. So a new thing that's tossed in and a consideration that we have to take into account. So as we mentioned in Gross and we mentioned here again, the focus absolutely is on, on safety. What is unique about the food additive petition process is the FDA is in the driver's seat. They, they say what is safe and that can be part of why we talk about whether or not Gross is broken in that debate that we had because the facilities can't make that determination on levels of safety and uh, what, what is safe. It's completely in the hands of the FDA. Exposure levels and intended use are the two keys, uh, looking at uh, how it's prepared, how it's consumed, looking at the dietary intake levels. And uh, the FDA has a PowerPoint I'm sure you have seen if you've been in the industry for a bit on food additives, on food contact substances, on gross. And the language they, that's used there in the presentation is an estimation of exposure proposed conditions of use concentration. And so that's what it's, that's what's the lens they're going to view, this panel will view the safety data and the intended use and the intake levels. And they will make a determination. A facility may, in the petition, say, we want a certain amount of milligrams, milliliters, whatever the, the level is going to be that want to add to the, the food products. And the FDA may not agree with that level. So it's going to set the level that has no toxicological effects, no toxicity is going to be one of the primary uh, factors in, in safety and it's going to set the level there and so if the level uh, is not satisfactory for what the facility wants it can attempt to work with the FDA to to show more safety data to show uh, something that will allow it to make that determination otherwise it's the way it's going to be set and so if it doesn't work it doesn't work but it, it's it's what the FDA can do and so again different than gross no self-affirmation, and, and you do get to make that self-determination initially, but that self-determination may not be what the FDA agrees with. So it can change um, what that level of safe uh, ends up being. And we saw in the previous uh, lecture as well that that standard is a reasonable certainty of no harm. That's again a factor here. So when we talked about that substantive review, you hear the FDA refer to it as a technical review. It's at a bare minimum of four, uh, I call it a four member, but you know, you're probably going to have more actual people. It's at least a four department review looking at consumer safety, environmental, chemistry, and toxicology. And, and at least those four departments, uh, department heads will be involved. There may be some others as we talked about. And what they're looking at in their technical review, they're going to start immediately by looking at the review of the safety data. And what will be interesting, it, you would normally think of this as occurring maybe in a staggered approach that uh, toxicology, you know, would look at it and say, yeah, great, pass it on to consumer safety, pass it on to environmental, uh, pass it on to chemistry. The statutory time frame that we'll talk about didn't initially allow for that. And so what the FDA does is everyone's looking at it simultaneously, what was called a, what's called a parallel review. So chemistry is looking at safety data. Uh, consumer safety, safety data, all of them are looking at safety data simultaneously to make a determination and come in to meet to see where that safety data is weak for their particular analysis. Uh, again, we're looking at intended use and intake levels, a real important feature. If after, after the initial review, the FDA determines that there is questions about the data, there is not enough data, there is an opportunity to come back and provide that. It's not gonna be an immediate rejection the FDA will come back and request more data if possible, uh, and also some questions. So again, this is part of why we see it be such a long process, uh, typically 24 months, because if the, these communications with the FDA are gonna take time. And if you have to um, get more data, if that's gonna be clinical data that you have to collect or safety data you're gonna have to collect, that can take time to do as well. <clears throat> 
So once that review is complete, they're going to document it, call, uh, create what's called the administrative record. And as part of that, they're going to make a recommendation. And in that recommendation, which will become eventually the final regulation, will be set the dietary intake level, the level that can be used for uh, this added substance and, and, and other recommendations, a standard of identity restrictions, uh, any physics re restrictions, labeling restrictions, all of those sort of recommendations are coming in at that point and, and coming through. So I've been alluding to time frames because it's, it's always funny to look at time frames. Uh, time frame is again set statutorily, it's a 348C, it provides a 90-day window, amazing that Congress would think that an administrative agency could accomplish a technical review in 90 days, but that's what they decided. And in their wisdom, they said, well, you can have a 90-day extension if it looks like you're not going to be able to complete it within the initial 90 days. It doesn't happen. 180 days is not enough time to conduct a review, get additional data, it rarely happens. I, I, I can't think of an example where a 180-day review was completed. So we're, in a sense, violating the statute, but in a way we're having this discretion in, in enforcing the statute that all administrative agencies have. And so Section 348C is a guideline. It's a recommendation, but you're not going to be able to hold the agency, agency to it and go through a judicial challenge saying they didn't meet their 180-day time frame there's no there's no benefit to that. It's it's the way it is, and it's the reality that it's going to take a couple of years to, uh, to get through that process. So you know statutory timeframes are fun to look at, but uh, in reality don't have a lot of meaning. So the amendment in 348C, I believe it's C, uh, has also what the FDA has to do, which is basically two two things. They can say yay or nay, and if they say yes, they have to issue a new regulation. Uh, and there's a, a part that we'll, we'll get into next week that you can find where all those are listed and we'll look at a couple. Uh, there's a CFR part that we'll look at. And then the FDA, if it does deny, has to provide an explanation why, what particular safety concerns, uh, if the dietary intake levels were deemed at no level safe, et cetera, how it's going to look at that. And that's the two options. There's no uh, third option per se in the statute, but the FDA has created this category of interim food additives. But the interim food additive typically doesn't come through the process of uh, approval here. If interim food additive has been applied predominantly to gross substances that were deemed not particularly safe, uh, they had some particular questions about it, and so they went through this process where a sponsor had to pick up the, the question of safety and, and, and carry that mantle for the FDA basically through a food additive petition. So for uh, our purposes here, there's really two answers, yes or no. And for gross, there's the interim food additive. And we'll talk about interim food additives, additives in our last discussion of um, the amendment because they are very interesting and very controversial. So it's, it's good to spend some time looking at the uncertainty of what is unfolding uh, because it, there's just so much uncertainty in this process because you put down a particular level that you believe is safe, the FDA may agree or disagree, and so that's a risk, that's an uncertainty in the process. And then you finally reach the finish line and the FDA publishes the regulation and, and you're on the verge of approval. And then you have this notice and comment period and you just cross your fingers and hope that there's no uh, objections. If there's no objections, there's no hearing, you're, you're done. You're going to get your regulation and you can start uh, manufacturing with the added substance. If, however, there's a material objection the FDA is going to schedule a hearing. They're reluctant to do hearings, but if there's a material objection, they have an obligation to hold a hearing. And there's going to be comments and hearings, and then there will be a consideration of those comments to see was that substantive objection, was that material objection relevant? Should we go back and look at that particular question and revise the regulation in a particular way? It may or may not do that. It may provide a rationale for why it doesn't. It typically will provide a rationale for why it doesn't. And so that's something that could happen is a revision or uh, potentially the comments are heard and nothing happens, which you're then nearly done. You're almost to the finish line of using the regulation. The last potential hurdle is a judicial challenge. And that's why I provided the reading on aspartame 
it's a fascinating subject to look at in particular as a case study and we could spend uh, you know a good three or four weeks just looking at the aspartame scenario and how that uh, speaks to the FDA policy making the FDA regulation the, the politi um, politicizing the process uh, all of those elements are there in aspartame which makes it really interesting an eight-year process uh, it's currently you know the way that it gained approval raises a lot of questions it's been some judicial challenges and so you know that's the worst case scenario that we see in aspartame and and it's not going to be the norm for what happens but it gives an idea of the risks that are available or, or, or potential for this process that could occur and so the more novel the more controversial the substance the more likely that when you a facility goes through this process that the the public nature of it will draw attention and that attention could lead to judicial challenges some examples that come to mind uh, there's a lot of controversy over GMO a lot of controversy uh, over derivatives of high fructose corn syrup uh, some different things that are novel and new and, and consumers aren't comfortable with or consumer groups feel that uh, maybe should not be on the market. So it's an interesting it's an interesting aspect of this process to look at. It's also great to raise because we're looking again at this concept of uh, food additive amendment being from 1958. We see that the statutory time frames are outdated. Does that mean that the overall process is outdated? Does the food additive process need to be changed? Or is it, you know, when we compare it to gross, should it actually be the norm and we should be like color additives and not have a gross exemption? Those are all great questions to ask because uh, we see some controversial elements to this process and uh, it raises legitimate questions. So that's our discussion. We'll leave it there. We'll uh, carry on into the discussion board for this week. We will pick up next with uh, getting into some substantive components of food additives, looking at some of the guidance documents, looking at some of the approval criteria, and gain a better sense of how one of these substances is approved. And that's where we'll pick up.